If I hadn't drunk an entire gallon of tea back at the hotel, maybe none of this would have happened. Well, maybe if we hadn't gotten kicked out of the hotel, none of this would have happened. It had been just the two of us in the small car, but with the animosity heavy on the air, it felt overcrowded. I don't know what had been worse, the hour of arguing, the two hours of silence afterwards, or the burgeoning realization that maybe I didn't know him as well as I thought I did. I studied him out of the corner of my eye. We'd been together for several months, but the recent experience left me wondering if I had ever even met the real Brian, who he truly was on the inside. It had been our very first trip together. We'd saved up for one of those super fancy hotels and had been having a great time until, of course, Brian decided to attempt a five-finger discount in the jewelry store in the lobby. He told me when we first started dating that he'd had some run-ins with the law in the past when he was young, and that was the only way to put food on the table, and I'd understood. But this wasn't the same. It wasn't for survival. It was just greed. We'd both spent the rest of our vacation money, and then some, paying for that $1,800 watch so no charges would be pressed. They still kicked us out. I don't blame them. Asking him to stop at the next place we came across was the first thing I'd said to him in hours, and he nodded, solemnly. My discomfort was escalating to the point where I was considering asking him to pull over on the side of the road. Rain be damned. When we saw the dim sign flickering in the distance, a small store was out of place on the quiet, tree-lined mountain road. We'd been deep in a tunnel of trees and hadn't seen so much of a hint of the lights in the distance. It seemed to just appear into view as we went around the bend. I didn't recall seeing it on the way to the hotel, so it was a pleasant surprise. I felt a flood of relief wash over me. It stuck out in the otherwise beautiful mountain landscape. Windows, so dirty that the light inside barely reached us through them. Several letters on the sign lit up in such a way that the only word we could even see was a blood red mark flickering. Any relief I'd managed to feel was short-lived. When we walked in, we both froze as we took in the interior. I instantly wished we'd just stopped by the side of the road after all. I looked at Brian and could tell he felt it too. He was fiddling with his new watch and took off his glasses, cleaned them on his shirt, and put them back on as if that would make what he was seeing make more sense. There were no other customers, no employees visible. It was just the two of us. Ceiling tiles hung askew and the floor was filthy. We had to step over a drain in the floor with grimy stains circling it to walk in. If it weren't for the lights, gentle hum of the AC, and grinding sounds floating from down the long hallway at the back, I'd have thought the place was abandoned. It was humid inside, and the smell coming from the old coolers that lined the back walls hit me as soon as we walked in. It reminded me of the summer my dad had decided to dabble in taxidermy in our basement. The slight hint of rot that lingered on the damp air indicated poorly done taxidermy at that. As I darted towards the back towards the restroom sign, a placard dangling off it caught my eye, informed me the restroom was for paying customers only. I quickly perused the shelves for something to buy. The aisles were tall, nearly to the ceiling, and despite the store being somewhat small, I felt the panicked sense of being cornered and trapped in an endless maze, at risk of becoming lost in there forever. The food on the shelves resembled nothing like the usual chips and candy these types of stores carry. There were rows upon rows of soft-looking mystery items. In plastic wrap, some of them leaked a red-brown residue down the shelves. None of it looked remotely appealing. I passed by a section with a stained placard that said handcrafted from local artists that was filled with eclectic items, none of which seemed to go together. There were torn shirts with random logos, nothing related to the town or area. We were in, stained with mud, grass, and God knows what else. Dried ropey things formed small, and delicate sculptures of animals unlike any I'd seen before. I reached for a bracelet with intricately carved white beads, but nearly dropped it when I realized the band was made up of woven human hair. It left a residue on my hand, and I noticed then that the same sour rot smell was coming from the collection of items. Two, I opted for a flat and lukewarm Dr. Pepper instead, and placed two $2 coins on the glass counter in front of the hand scrawled shoplifters will be processed sign near the register. I figured I misread it. After all, it looked like it had been written by a hand unused to holding a pen. Brian had grabbed an armful of those unnerving plastic wrapped packages, but hovered at the counter a bit too long. 
I could hear the scrape of him retrieving the coins on the glass, the sound of him dropping them into his pocket. He gave me a pointed stare as he did so. I sighed, so tired of arguing that I just walked away from him. And down the hallway, I figured I'd pay after he got back in the car. No sooner had I closed the door to the women's room behind me than I could hear him talking to someone. His voice rose until he was nearly yelling, mortified and trying to delay being involved in another incident. That day, I splashed water on my face while trying to drown out what appeared to be a one-sided argument. I kept trying to wash the grimy feeling that had lingered on my hands after picking up the bracelet, but no matter how I scrubbed, I couldn't get it off. It kept getting worse. I felt nauseous. When I realized the greasy residue was coming from the pale yellow bar of soap, I decided I'd scrub my hands raw at our next stop and stepped out into the hall and back to the store. Brian wasn't there. I called out for him, but all I heard in answer was that same vague whirring and drilling sound coming from further down the long hallway. I doubled back to the car, but found it empty. I circled the store, my frustration turning to panic as I shouted his name and still got no response. I called his phone, it just rang and rang before going to voicemail. The car was locked and he had the keys. I couldn't help but feel nervous standing out there in the rain. They were still in the middle of the deep woods and with clouds obscuring the light of the moon and stars, the area was blanketed in darkness. I reluctantly headed back inside. Somehow, the smell had managed to become even worse. I gagged when the wet, disgusting air hit my nose again. It was so strong I could nearly taste it, putrid on my tongue. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was always someone just behind me as I walked quickly through the tall aisles, but whenever I looked over my shoulder, there was never anything there. I called his phone, wondering how I'd managed to lose him in such a small store. When I finally heard it ringing, it was echoing from down that long hallway. As I headed towards it, I heard someone moving on the other side of the floor to ceiling aisle, placing something onto the shelf with a sickening wet thud before weaving lightly through the aisles behind me. Ryan, I called out softly, trying to convince myself that everything was fine, trying to disguise my fear. I knew it wasn't him. I don't know how, but I knew it. Have you ever had the feeling that if you look closely enough at something, if you truly see it, you'll never be able to close your eyes again without it haunting you? That feeling of being in close proximity to something that your fragile mind was never meant to know existed. I forced myself to turn around anyways. Once again, whoever or whatever had been there was gone by the time I rounded the aisle, but I heard a gentle clinking sound and saw a trail of red-pink droplets. I followed it back to that section, handcrafted from local artists. There was something new hanging from a hook near the shelves. Wet, glistening strips dangled from along what looked to be a curved bone with bits of grizzle still attached. From one of them hung an expensive men's wristwatch. Another was tied around a shattered, thick glasses lens. Then another sagged under the weight of car keys. They gently swayed with the motion of having been recently placed. Fluid continued to drip from the still wet viscera and mingled with the mud on my shoes. Shoplifters will be processed. I didn't need to see the items down the other aisles to figure out what I was looking at. What must have happened? I could already tell that we'd never have another argument ever again. I heard a door open and close in the back, soft footsteps approaching from down the hallway. I realized that in my distraction, I'd forgotten to put money back on the counter. I choked up, but knew there was nothing I could do for him. So, I tossed the first bills I found in my purse onto the floor, frantically untangled the car keys, and in shock, I drove myself the remaining four-hour drive home. Every so often, along the quiet country roads, those I could have sworn were empty on the drive up, I'd see that grimy building, the sign, mark flashing in the distance. I didn't stop once. I've been home for a week now. A few nights ago, something triggered a motion alert on my video doorbell but there was no one there when I checked the footage. The next morning, I found a cardboard box on my porch with no stamp or return address, and it was a torn t-shirt and several of those now familiar wrapped packages, putrid fluid leaking out of them through the bottom of the soggy cardboard. I've received a similar box every night since. I don't know if it's meant as a threat or if due to some sort of twisted interpretation, I'm now a paying customer. He's slowly being returned to me. Either way, it turns out that I've gotten to see who Brian was on the inside, after all.